Take a seat, Miss Lacey. <laughs> I love talking to her. We could talk all night long. Yeah. <laughs> what a blessing this is to get an opportunity to, to talk to you about this amazing book. Can you see how much I've read of this book? I've got all my little <laughs> notepads and little stickies to tell me what I've read, but honestly, it's in my heart, Lacey, because you have just poured yourself into this book, and it's been so fun and easy to read. It's kind of like reading your journal. <laughs> how many of you like to, to journal? Do you, anybody out there journal? Not all that many of you. Um, I'm hit and miss with it, but I think that it's so fun to read other people's journals. <laughs> I'm really grateful that you wrote this. <laughs> it's like we get a little peek into Lacey's heart and her mind and her life, and it's just so amazing because um, what you see just expressed in her countenance while she's singing is exactly what you get in this book. It's just very honest and transparent. It's awesome. So I, I just wanted to begin by asking you in this book called The Return, like, um, why did you write this book? <laughs> why did you write this? Well, I... I feel like a lot of times, uh, well, when, when I first started writing, when I wrote my first book, I remember somebody asking me, what is the one thing that you would want to say if you had one thing to say to the world? And the first thing I would want to say is I would want to tell them about salvation yeah. and how I came to know the Lord as mm. God when I was an atheist and suicidal and how he rescued me yeah. from uh, dying, from ending my life and from living you can tell us about that. I mean, are there are women here that don't know that story. I wrote about that in um, my book, The Reason. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the thing was that, you know, when I was growing up, I, my mom always talked to me about God. And when I, how many people out here have, have never heard that story, my story about, wow, great. <laughs> okay. Because I feel like I tell it a lot. So it's an amazing story. But, it's a so anyway, I was a young, when I was young, my mom always talked to me about God, and she was a single mom. At one point, there, there were six of us, six kids, and um, she struggled. Um, she was a musician, and she has great music, but um, it was hard with six kids, I think, you I know? Um, and was she was 14, 16. She was, she was a teen mom. She was 15 when she had my brother, 16 when she had me. Wow. And um, so we went through a lot of stuff, just that by itself was a lot. But um, we had struggled financially, and um, and so whenever my mom would tell me, like she would give our food stamps away back then. There was like paper food stamps, and she would give her some food stamps to somebody she thought needed it more than us. And I was like, Mom, what about you know our food? What are you doing? I mean, little kid, you know, looking at you, telling oh my goodness. And um, and she's like, Shh, God will feed us, you know. God will take care of us. And he would, you know. And so I believed in God when I was little. And then when I was 10 years old, um, I had a, a tragedy happen in our family. And my cousin was three years old, same age as my little brother. They were best friends. And um, he was beaten to death by his stepfather. Wow. And I remember thinking, I thought he was going to take care of us. Mm. What, what, where was God, you know. Mm. So I became angry at God. And I felt like a loyalty wow. to my cousin's death would be to stay sad for him. Oh, wow. And I became addicted to sadness, <laughs> I would call it. Wow. Um, anytime I caught myself laughing or whatever, I would um, stop and say, oh, no, I'm supposed to be sad, you know, mm. for my cousin. And mm. went through depression. And um, I talked about this. That, that led you to a really dark place because the depression just spiraled down, didn't right. it? Right, right. And I, I, I hung out with people who hated people because I hated people. And I remember... Oh, wow, wow. You know, I I, mm -hmm. um, I thought that if you're happy, that something's wrong with you mm -hmm. because this how world. Can you, how can you be happy in a world where things like that happen? Right. Yeah. So when people were uh, hateful, I thought, oh, you get it. <laughs> mm. Mm. So um, those were my friends I picked. And <laughs> um, still hang out with those people in rock shows, but <laughs> as a rock star, maybe. But um, I still love those people. <laughs> And that's important. Yeah. Yes, those are my favorite people still. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I like particularly we're like that. Over there, the word Josh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my husband. He's so his story is so different from mine. Yeah. He's always like, "What? Why? Why are you laughing at this? This isn't sad." 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but he was, you know, he has a great story on his own. But then when I was uh, 16, I, you know, if somebody told me something was a sin, I would do it so that they knew why they couldn't control me. Mm-hmm. You know, and so sin is, I didn't realize, is just God telling us what leads to death. Yeah. It's not him trying to control us or he would make us a tree. You know, it's just, right. you didn't no, do that. No you're not going to move anywhere. Right. Like you said. Yeah. We talked about that. Yeah, we did. Um, so he, he gives us choice. We're not just instinctual animals. No. You know, no. we have choice. <laughs> We're reasonable. Yeah. And, yes. And so um, he's like, now this is life, this is death. And I, I didn't realize I was choosing death so often wow. that I was worn out. And it does wear you out. Mm. And um, so by the time I was 16, I was tired of waking up. And I decided I don't like doing this anymore. And as an atheist, I decided to yeah. plan to commit suicide. And on that day, I ended up... And how old were you? 16. 16. Wow. And on that day, I ended up in church after getting in a fight with my grandma for forcing me to go to church. Thanks, Granny. Good for Granny. Yep. Love you. <laughs> Doing the job. <laughs> and, um, and that night, somebody, the, the, the pastor started telling my story like I was the only one there. And then I was stopped at the back of the room, and the guy prayed for me, and I had an encounter with God. Oh. And I was like, it was terrifying. And that was atheist. a rescue. Oh. Yeah, and I, and I knew he was real. And he, he's real. <laughs> mm. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is real. He's real. And that was when you were 16. And it's like what, some of the journal entries in this book right. are when you were 16. Right. In 97 or right. something like that. You were, you were so young. <laughs> but what was so amazing and impressed me so much about the fact that you were 16, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of things impressed me. The fact that you were writing and keeping a journal that at that young age and I was writing worse, th- very bad things before that. So you were writing, you were writing, but you were using that <laughs> to express the, the anger yes, and the hate. Because I was addicted to sadness. I would write down sad things wow. so I could, wow. it was like a meditation on bad wow. things. Wow. It was weird. I don't know why I did that. Yeah, <laughs> I, just, I mean, that's what the, that's the plans that the enemy mm-hmm. has. Some of, it takes us, some of us a little longer to get there. Mm-hmm. But here you are at 16, having gone that full gamut, you know, and discovering that it was, the end was death. And then right. the Lord intervening mm-hmm. and rescuing you. And now you're, now you're a Christian. Right. And now you're journaling. Right. And you're journaling the things that we read in here that were so <laughs> crazy. And I noticed the first thing about your journal in 97 at the top was the scriptures that right. you were reading in the morning and in the evening. Right. So you begin your new life in Christ with reading the Bible. Yes, because and I was I was a smart aleck, and I didn't believe anything anybody said. So I had to... You had to find it for yourself. Yes. So, I, so if somebody said something, Amazing. I'd be like, why? Where is that? Is that true? You know, people... You know, I, I said this yesterday about if the pastor says, <laughs> bring your Bible to church. Yeah. And he says, open to Mark 4 and chapter verse, you know, 17 or whatever. I don't know what that is. <laughs> but um, if he I says that... Mark 4 said. <laughs> Mark 4. We're, we're talking about the, the, the blade and the ear and the grain. Well, is that from Mark, Mark 4? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know what I'm saying. But, um, <laughs> but it, if he says that to you... Um, yeah. he's not trying to make you feel guilty because you don't have a Bible or you don't know where Mark 4 is or whatever. He's trying to show you, I'm not making this up. You can read it for yourself. And he's trying to say, you know, if, if it's out of context, you can read the context. You know, yeah. we don't have to just believe what somebody else says. You have a Bible to tell you. And everything that, you know, this is built on the scripture. <laughs> and so it's like, is that true? I want to see it. And so every day I would read, and I was amazed mm-hmm. that all the questions that were going on in my head, mm-hmm. I would, the Bible would become alive. <laughs> it says it's alive. Yeah. Like, the Bible says it's alive. Whoa. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're into, like, magic books, like, this is really way better than, <laughs> it's, it's alive. <laughs> It's better than any, this is so, the real deal, actually. It is so true. I mean, you may, be, you may be thinking you're just sitting here in a room full of girls and you're hearing girls talk and you're, 
There is stuff <laughs> going on, layers of stuff in the spiritual realm right, right now, right happening in our midst right now. There are forces of darkness trying to influence you, mm -hmm. forces of light trying to influence you. You have mm -hmm. a choice, and you have the truth, and we're speaking the truth. Mm -hmm. We're praying that that darkness, whatever it is, that stronghold will be broken. And yeah. You'll see it for what it is. That yes. It will be unmasked. Yes. And, and so you began with the scriptures, and I noticed that one of the first scriptures that you wrote was Jeremiah 29, 11. Yes. That was really important to me mm. as an, um, I'm sorry to look. You always make me cry. I don't make you cry. You I don't even know why. <laughs> She's like, did y'all hear what she said? That was so, no, y'all. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, um. As a person who felt like I was another mouth to feed in my home because I was a burden, which my mom did not make, it wasn't my mom's fault, it was just something I noticed, you know? People are made to feel like burdens mm. now, even like, <laughs> and we think children are that way, and as, as a kid, I always felt that way. And to find that, I feel like an atheist who has no purpose, yeah. it's just an accident, they just happened, and you get the most you can out of life, which it leaves you empty, and then what's the point? And so t Jeremiah 29, 11 was really important to me because even all the messes that I made with my life, I talk about this in the devotional because we actually go through the, the Bible studies oh, so great. in the, the video devotional. So yeah. I talk about how Je Je um, Jeremiah 29, 11 is about how God can turn your mess from right where you are mm. into his purpose and he has a plan for that, even if you think you messed up the plan. Yeah, that's he has so a funny. plan right there. He's talking to the people when they were going off to captivity because they had been messed up their lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's like, but even there I have a plan for you to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. So and that was, that was really so anchoring for me. That's, that's, a, that's a huge um, eye-opening thing when you're that age to recognize because we all, you know, especially when you're young and even when you get older, you still look at your future as this blank slate that it's up to you to determine, you know, the good things that are going to come and you have to work hard and you have to make the right choices and what if you don't and what right. if you make the wrong choice? But God's plan <laughs> can never be thwarted. Wow. God's good plan for your life can never be thwarted. And uh, t for you to have laid hold of that is so, so great. It's good news for people who have made mistakes. You think that, you know, oh, you like know, me. I messed up plan A. There is no plan B. No, God has plan A all along, plan A, and it'll be good. You know, we bring ourselves to him. But you, um, you would give us a sneak peek into this <laughs> high school Lacey. And right. would you tell us a little bit about what um, high school Lacey was doing and thinking mm -hmm. um, you know, you, we look at Lacey PCR. now and this amazing platform that she's been given and the you know, recognition by things like Billboard magazine and the, the, thing, the places that she's gone with her gift that God has given her. But where, where was Lacey in high school? Because I know that there are young girls here that are you know, just kind of figuring out life. They're in junior high or high school or maybe in college or they're just stepping into their careers and they're like, okay, well, I don't have a gift like her and I don't have anything spectacular, but... Where were you in high school, and what were some of the things that, that you liked to do in high school? And I mean, like fifth period math class. What was that like for Lacey when she's thinking about the plans God has for her? Well, I, again, I, my plan for myself was to die. Mm. I had no plan. I had no, um, <laughs> I had no reverence for my life. I, I didn't have a plan to do anything past that day. Wow. So I was just like, okay, well, I'm here still. Why? What do you want? What do you, what can I do? And I just kept feeling how much God loves me. Like I kept experiencing that every time I was like, it happened in this church. So every time the doors are open, I'm there. I'm like trying to figure out how to get as close as I can to God because he's the coolest thing I've ever experienced. Like the high that I got was wow. better than any wow. drugs. It was the best relationship of love. I had never experienced love before that, yeah. that I understood it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my grandparents loved me, but I didn't understand it. I didn't experience it until that moment. And so, like, every time doors are open, I'm in the church at the front by myself because that's where I felt him the first, or, like, the most or something. Like, I'm by myself just going, God, what do you want? And, right. and so I heard somebody say, you know, if you're faithful with the little, 
Yes. You know, and I was yeah. reading that and I was like, well, what do I have in front of me? <laughs> I mean, what can I do? I can wash the, you know, the dishes for my grandma. And I, you know, that really makes her feel like, and I could do it for you. Or I could babysit my brothers and sisters. Or I could, you know, very intentionally work at Shoney's where I worked, you know, as a waitress. And do it on purpose and love you, you know. And, um, and that was, the, those were the opportunities that you had at that moment. So you're not like, right. oh, wait, God's using and God's planning for my life is somewhere way off in the future. That right now I'm just sort of biding my time and doing all this other stuff I don't really like to do. But down no. the road someday, but you started, I had because no, every day was a gift and God's love was so good. I had, again, I had no plan, plan for the future. I, 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 as far as I knew, I was on borrowed time. Wow. And so what I know is that I have today what is in front of me with today. Yeah. And that's all I knew to do. And that's kind of what I talk about in the book is like, what do you have, you know. And what were the opportunities that Lacey and high school had? Well. I, mean, I know, you mentioned babysitting and <laughs> helping Granny sweep, sweep the floors. or. Well, whatever. I did you know how to play guitar. My mom always played the guitar. Uh -huh. And uh, my brother and I learned to play guitar together. Um, and I didn't really want to do music because my mom was struggled was with it. And I, and I was like, I don't want to be poor. I want to have money. I want to buy groceries, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I never wanted to be a musician. I kind of had this anger towards musicianry. <laughs> wow. Um, but I also knew that, that there was a scripture about not hiding your gifts and your talents and if there's anything that you can do. And I didn't necessarily think it was a gift or a talent, but I didn't know how to do it. Yes. So I'm like, well, here, you know, I'm going to play these songs in my room for you just because you, maybe you like it. And then, I know <laughs> God. In, the, in the book you mentioned that you were, um, you were just playing a, a, a popular worship song. Uh-huh, of a passion and then, CD. And as you were playing that, God started giving you words. To, yeah, so I'm playing the chords for that song, and I'm just trying to connect with him you know, and forget what I'm doing. And all of a sudden I start to hear a story in my head and the lyrics to a song about me and my brother. And so I started to write that. And, um, and that was the first song I wrote. First song you've ever written. For the Lord, yeah. For the Lord. Yeah. And I wasn't trying to do that, but I, so I wanted to steward it. Because yeah, you use that word a lot in, in your book, stewarding. I was going to call the book The Stewardess, what? but they didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would have been funny. I, it doesn't quite have the they same like, ring to it as a. They were know, right, I guess. Uh, but. The reason, the return, the stewardess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but you are. We all are. Yeah. We all are because we're told that God has given to each one of us gifts. Yeah. And 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 the faith that we need to use those gifts. Yeah. So the gift that you kind of had in, in little embryo form was this right. gift of singing and writing music. And, and it wasn't very long before you had the opportunity, that song you wrote about your brother in the room, that you had the opportunity to, to use that. Yeah, the art teacher. Tell us, tell us about that. <laughs> there is an art teacher in our high school that, again, I was not a good student. <laughs> I was mean, and I was. I had to apologize to my teachers later on, and I. Saw okay, them again. my my granddaughter Riley was listening to this last night, and the part where you said you had about math that was so funny. <laughs> you have to say your your attitude towards math and towards your. Well, math. I was always like, why? I was always asking the question why, which is not a good question in math. There's like no reason. Like it's <laughs> why, why, and it's so. How many of you relate to that in math? <laughs> Like, Some why? people love math. <laughs> why do there have to be imaginary numbers? Aren't there enough numbers? Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> I'm so mad about that. I still get mad thinking about it. <laughs> um, and negative numbers. Right. What? <laughs> why? Um, but, but I got kicked out of math class a lot asking those questions. <laughs> and I'm laughing about it, but I genuinely feel so sad for my math teacher. She's a nice lady, Miss Rutledge, you know, she's <laughs> nice. And I got a chance to apologize. So you apologize had to apologize to her. Well, I was in, I can't believe I met, I saw her later and was like, oh, Jesus, thank you. We get to apologize. But, um, <laughs> um, so you got to use that, that little song that you wrote. So the teachers found out that I became a Christian. 
<laughs> Somehow I'm, they found out. Well, no, they found out because you probably looked completely different. I guess. I mean, they, probably. There must, there must have been something. something you must happened. have told someone. I was telling people, like kids, yeah. I, mean, I guess. The kids, the narcs there, they knew. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Like, hey, she became a Christian. Wow. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Well, letting your light shine <laughs> in, the, in those places where you had. Yeah, and so she came to me at lunch, and she was like, well, did you know in our room there's a, every, every whatever Monday they have a Christian club, and I heard that you play guitar, and they were trying to find somebody to play, so would you like to come play a song? And I was like, okay, God, I guess you want me to do that. Wow. And so I just wanted to say yes when he. And you did. You said yes. Yeah, and then I. So wild. And I, I went. mean, I would be like, your first song you write, and uh -huh. the next day you get this opportunity to sing. That's right. I mean, God gives us <laughs> That was us like gifts. a joke. I mean, the whole thing. <laughs> God's <laughs> funny. The, the first thing that, you know, you write, the very next day you get a chance to, to sing. Well, he, um, they, I played the song, and I was trying to not pay attention to anybody. I was just trying to connect with God. And it was hard because, um, of course, you're in a room with people, and it feels very intimate because, like, it's a very, I feel like crying again. I, don't know what, I guess worship is a really intimate thing. It is. And to, you know, there's a scripture about casting your pearls out there and mm -hmm. people trampling on them and attacking you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but to be able to share what God had done was hard, and also I felt like it was important because it wasn't just about me, wow. you know, and I, it's just about God. And if he said, Do, don't hide it, I, mm -hmm. so I went and did it, and then as I'm trying to connect with God and forget everybody out there, after it's over, I open my eyes for the first time, and there's a girl crying in the front row, and wow. I realized, wow, you, you can do something with this. Like, Isn't that amazing? I, yeah. That is so cool. And I knew that was God who was wanting to use it for something. Well, God gives us his gifts so that we will use them. <laughs> not, not hide them under a bushel, right? Yes. So that, you know, that is so beautiful. But, you know, um, your life uh, before, you said you were struggling and you were depressed and you were in darkness and you had, you know, this um, love for anger and hatred and it was spiraling yeah. you down. And after you became a Christian, after you gave your life to the Lord, mm -hmm. um, you write about in your book that that, that kind of s circled around again in a conversation with a girl. And it started, that feeling, that darkness started to yeah. kind of allure you again. Yeah. And I know that there's, you know, a lot of people out there struggle with depression and even thoughts of suicide. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, are Christians. Yeah. And what would you say about that allure to, and you use some really graphic words in your book to describe that feeling of what it felt like, that comfortable blanket, that kind of gray, blue, you used very um, descriptive words that um, kind of helped me because I, I don't struggle with depression like that, but um, that you were saying that this was kind of alluring you back, mm -hmm. and then you you did something deliberately. You, you took some action. And what, you know, tell us about that. Tell us what that mm -hmm. feels like. Tell us why it is tempting mm -hmm. to you. Because there's somebody out there that may be struggling with this as well. Right. And then what you did that was so helpful for you, at least in that circumstance. That well, did. I do want to point out, and I think this is important in church, because the, one of the things I didn't like about mm -hmm. church and Christians and what made me judge them was that, they seem naive, and they seem not to face things. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to point out the fact that there is, you know, Jesus wept with Mary when Lazarus died. Mm -hmm. He knew he was going to raise him, but he wept with her. And there is a godly sorrow that's good for us. It's appropriate and the right place. When we weep with God. Yeah. But there's a worldly sorrow that will lead to death mm. when we don't weep with the Lord. And if you're doing it with God, it's, it's safe and you can be honest with him. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing it on your own apart from the Lord and pulling back into the darkness and not wanting to face him, mm -hmm. then you're going towards a place that's totally destructive. It will not. And, um, and I recognized that this particular moment was very much my old way of 
pulling into a destructive place. It wasn't the the right godly sorrow, or right. even as you know, um, we're told that you know that blessed are those who mourn, right. or there's a season I to laugh and a, a time to laugh and a time to cry. It wasn't that; it right. was something else. Yeah, I talk about that in the devotional too about sor godly sorrow. Yeah. And the thing is that when we there is a scripture where David says. Um, to his soul, my soul, why are you downcast within me? Put your hope in God. Yes. And so um, it's appropriate to speak to your soul mm -hmm. when we know it's, tr it's pulling us into a place apart from the Lord or a, part, a place that's dark. So our feelings are not our master. We, right. They serve us. We don't serve our feelings. Right, so, that's important. Right. So our feelings don't tell us the truth all the time. And we know that's true because we have once a month where we know our feelings <laughs> might be lying to us. Yes, we do. I hope we know that. Um, and if you don't, it's hard. You have a hard life row, if you, you don't will. know that. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> yeah, it's not always easy, is it? Well, it is. It and is you have to learn to recognize well, I did. What is true and what is real and what is right? Well, I spoke to somebody who was on antidepressants, um, a pastor friend of mine, mm -hmm. and he and he said he, he's still not he's not on them anymore. But he said what he loved about it was that it taught him to, sh to have a zero feeling so that he could see, when his when he was imbalanced, he could see how he was not seeing clearly, mm -hmm. and that there are some things in the moment that are, seem true but they're not. Um, and so I loved, I love that re 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 recognition yes. because it frees you from so having what, to be a slave to. At some to point during that moment where you were feeling drawn back and just sort of feeling like I'm just going to go with this feeling, right. you made a decision mm -hmm. to sort of walk away out of the room. Right. What did you do? Um, I went out of the room so that I, you know, because I felt that allure, it is attractive mm -hmm. to fall. In. It's so easy and comfortable. And when we've done it for so long, it's so easy to just slip back into mm -hmm. that. You know how this works. And so I felt that feeling of just pulling me into this place. And so, of course, yes, I, I got up and left the girl who was, I felt like she carried this. And I was not strong enough to stand in there and not get pulled in. Yeah. So I left the room and went to the bathroom. It was the only place to be alone. And, um, and I laid on the floor in there, and my, like knelt on the floor and, and just started to talk to God. And yeah. so before that, I would start to sing. Um, singing any, so I was trying to make up songs to God, and it was really, I didn't feel anything. I was just trying to sing to him. And then I thought of a song that I knew from church, and I just started singing that song. And eventually I felt the demons go quiet in my head and I felt hmm. the presence of God show up and the, the comfort of God in that moment. You describe it so beautifully. And you talk about um, removing yourself from that place of allurement and temptation and being alone with God and being alone with him in his throne room. Yeah. And instead of the, the darkness and the gray and the whatever that was drawing you into that that unhealthy mourning and sadness you felt in the throne room I mean the way you say is that the galaxies opened up and yeah and you were there in the presence of the Lord and you felt weightless and light and I'm not saying that you know you go from one feeling to another necessarily but in that moment in worship if you're able to just take hold yeah. and you even talked in about taking that step almost um Without emotion, singing without, you know, the feeling of it at first. Right. And then focusing in on the Lord, mm -hmm. it, you felt the darkness lift. Yes. Yeah, it was really... It, it, the Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Yeah. But it is resisting. It right. is taking... And sometimes it's just taking that first step of obedience, that first step of action. Yeah. Like remo removing yourself from that place. Yeah. And putting yourself deliberately in the presence of the Lord and then focusing, mm -hmm. you know, with your mind. First, yeah. not yeah. your emotions, but with your mind first, right. and then allowing. That. So great how he meets us. Yeah. It's so great how he knows where we're at, that he cares about that. And, yes, he does. and he also gives us that moment where we can get stronger and learn how to get stronger. It's not like he protects us from every mm -hmm. 
person that might tempt us or it's, it's about learning to be strong. Yeah. And I teach this to my boys all the time because, you know, when they when they get uh, tempted or they do something wrong, they want to hide. And I'm like, no, we're going to face this and we're going to make things right as much as it's up to us. Mm-hmm. I want them to learn to be, um, you know, because the men in my mom's life, when the things went wrong, they left. Wow. And I really want to teach my boys that, you know, you can go and you can face it. And don't be afraid to face anything. That was really cool from that uh, Spider-Verse movie. We don't run from things, Miles. She says that or whatever. I'm like, wow, that's so amazing. That's how we as Christians should be. Yeah. You know, he's, he, the dad's a police officer, so it's obvious he runs to the danger to protect. Mm. But as far as us and Christians, yeah. we should know the power within us can face the darkness. And we don't have to hide uh, in the darkness yeah. from God. We can face it with the light in us Amen. and deal with Amen. it. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so good. So good. You know, um, you mentioned that a lot of times in your after concerts or whatever, that you're meeting fans, signing autographs, that you have had girls in the line that they're, they're standing with their mom maybe, and, and you can see... You can see they are where you once were. Oh. And so often you only have a few minutes with them and how you wished that you had longer. Yeah. Oh, you have a whole room full of girls that would love to have, you know, five minutes straight with Lacey to pour into their life. What would you say to a girl that is, um, that is where you were, that is searching, you know, you, you talk about God having a purpose and a plan for their lives and, and wanting to, you, you, you're discovering that beautiful plan and they can see the beautiful plan displayed in your life and they, how did you get there? Yeah. What would you say to a girl like that? Well, that's why I wrote The Return. Um, I can't say everything I want to say about how I got here in, in a five-minute conversation. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like even, you know, well, the most important thing I would say is, that, you know, that I want to hit points that I expand on in the book, but that you are beautiful. You are uniquely made mm-hmm. from by the God who created the cosmos. Mm. If there's anything that's ever awed you about nature mm-hmm. or about someone else, The God who made everything, he made you on purpose in his image. And your body is a gift to you and to the world around you for him to dwell in and to shine. And, um, you know, we should take care of ourselves in that way, not in a selfish way, but in an um, honoring way to the God who made you. Because he loves you and... You know, if we recognize his love, that's when we're able to mm. um, to recognize our life as a gift. And with the little things that are right in front of you, you know, the opportunities, this life is, is, uh, is just a minute, but you have adventures that God has planned already for you. Don't try to be me. Don't try to be the person that you look up to because your DNA is different for a reason. Your fingerprint's different for a reason. Mm -hmm. Your perspective is different. There's a million ways we can identify you uniquely as the only person like you in all the whole history of the world and the world to come. You. That is so good. That's true. So, yeah. Lacey, I think that this is the moment where we would just say, we just ask the question that that girl might have asked had you said all those things to her. I know what my question would have been. I know what my question was when I heard and saw God's plan in someone's life and they began to tell me that God loved me too. My first question was, okay, now what? What do I do now? What is that next step? What, how do I begin this, this adventure with God? I don't know anything about God. I've heard about him. I know people who talk about him, but I don't know him. I want to know him. I want what you have. Tell me what to do. 
<laughs> and that's like the question that, you know, these girls, there may be several in this room that are asking that right now. Please tell me, I want it. Tell me what to do. Well, you just talk to God the same way you would talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. And your energy that goes into worrying or questioning or um, fear or anger or anything that goes on in your mind, the energy that you spend thinking about things or talking about things um, that bring up these questions of direction, where do I go, my purpose, yeah. you, you can actually do that with God. Yeah. You can talk to him. You can, you can process these things with him. He's very close. He's not a religious God that's far off that you get to one day. He's present right here actually in the room. It says that when more than one is gathered in his name, he is in our midst. He's right here. Mm. And this moment is a special moment even right now for all of you. Mm -hmm. He intended for you to be here tonight. He intended for you to hear this tonight. He is inviting you to come closer to him than you were before you came here tonight. He's inviting yes. me to that. Yeah. Come closer tonight. We will never get to the end of learning what it means to be close with Jesus. That's what we would do for eternity, learn about that. Mm -hmm. And with God and your maker who created you for glory. Mm -hmm. He wants his glory to shine through you. You know, we say all glory belongs to you and we worship. And that's true because he made us in his image so that we could be his image bearers. <laughs> Amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. Well, let's do it. <laughs> Was let's, that a lot? Let's begin that conversation yeah. with him. And I know, um, Lacey, you, ha you and Josh have an amazing song. We do. Oh, you, you, you requested this one. That's right. And I requested this song. Okay. I kind of sprung it on them. <laughs> but um, what we want to do right now is just give you the opportunity to begin that conversation with God, mm -hmm. to run to him. He's been running after you a <laughs> long time. Yeah. This is this is your moment to say, okay. Yeah. I believe you and I want this. So we're gonna tell you that Jesus came into the world, God's son came into this world to die on a cross to take care of all the wrongs that you ever did. Yeah. And he has taken care of everything that you will ever need for salvation. To know him, to walk with him, to go to heaven one day to begin this incredible adventure. He's done it all. And what we want to do is just say yes. That's it. Just say yes. Believe that he did that for you, as if there was no one else in this room, no one sitting next to you. He did it for you. And all he's waiting for you to do is to say, yes, God, I want you. I want to bring my life to you. So we're going to do an invitation right now. And I'm going to stand up and I'm going to encourage you, those of you that want to begin this conversation with God, that in this moment while Lacey and Josh sing this song called Run to You, we're going to ask you to just come forward and stand in front of this platform where we're going to lead you in that first conversation with God right here, right now. It's just that simple. He is just that close. So as Lacey sings, I'm going to invite you to step out into the aisles and just come forward. Say yes, Jesus. So, come on. Yes, come. Yeah. And you can do this while Lacey and Josh are singing as she sings these songs. Tell me I'm the one holding you back There's something about how far we're off track But all I hear is your heart beat loud and strong And I just want to wrap you in my arms But all you go if that's what you want but I hope you know my love won't stop you said it's not 
it's true, and you call me a fool, but call out my name, I'll run to you. I know you, I know your eyes so well, and I know you're not sure of yourself. Something made you restless years ago Till you forgot that I'm part of your soul But I'll let you go If that's what you want But I hope you know my love won't stop You say it's not true and you call me a fool, oh, but call out my name, I'll run to you. All over this room tonight, the Holy Spirit is knocking on hearts. Yeah. He's calling you to himself. There, um, there is a choice before you tonight. It's yes or no. It's either or. It's yes, God, I want what you want for me, or it's no, God, get out of my life, I'm running away. And it's a fearful thing to be in the balance, but it's also a great thing to surrender to the Spirit of God in your life and the plans that He has for you. And I want to encourage you, if you're sitting in the pew right now and you are just being ripped and you are like, I know I need to go forward, but you're resisting, don't, don't. This is your moment. This is a holy moment. He's calling you. And there may be those of you that are outside, that are seated outside in the amphitheater. I want to invite you to come into the back of the sanctuary here. There's going to be a whole lot of ladies in here. Whole, really happy to see you. And our prayer team is going to be down here in front to pray with you in just a moment. So don't hesitate while Lacey sings and Josh sings. Come forward. Come. We're waiting. God's waiting. He's been waiting a whole lot longer than we've been waiting. And we want you all to come, every last one of you that don't know Jesus. Come now. Um, Lacey, if she'll sing that one more time, and I want you to really listen to the words that she's singing because I believe they are God speaking. He will let us go if that's what we want, but He wants us to know that His love is still calling you. You know, you might be really young out there, you might be really old out there. You may think that, you know, this event was for young people, but it's never too late. No to begin a walk with the Lord. When we look at our lives in the scope of eternity, 
we're all just beginning. We're all just beginning. It's not too late. No matter what age you are, it doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter what you've done. You may feel like you have so wrecked your life. It's not too late. No. He can give you that fresh slate, blank slate to begin again, to start a new life with Him. Maybe you ran away from Him once. Maybe you knew Him at one time. Maybe you were raised in the church. Maybe you've heard the name of Jesus, but you've never really followed Him. You've never really surrendered all your life to Him. Now's the moment. Today's the day. Tonight's the night. God's voice is, He's calling you. Listen to this one more time, and then we're going to pray with everyone who came down front. Don't hesitate. If you're outside, come in. If you're in the balcony, come down. If you're seated in the back, come on forward. We want to pray with you. He's waiting for you. Yeah. I'll let you go If that's what you want But I hope you know My love won't stop You said it's not true And you called me a fool Call out my name, I'll run to you. I'll run to you, run to you. I've always believed in you. Run to you, I'll run to you. Because I love you, I'll let you go. If that's what you want. feel like I want to say one more time, those of you that are still sitting that may feel that tug, I want to ask you the question, is this your final answer? Is this your final answer? Because you don't know what's going to happen when you walk out those doors tonight. You don't know. None of us do. How long we have, how many choices we're given. There's going to come that final opportunity to know Jesus, and I, I want you to know that He's waiting for you. Let's not make no the final answer, or later God the final answer, right? That's right. Say yes. Just say yes to Him. know that his plans are so much better than your plans. They really are. They really are. All right. Yes. Yeah. God bless you guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think these are some of the ladies from our prayer team that are coming down to pray with you and those of you that came I mean you go you guys down here you were right on it you came right at the very beginning you've been waiting a long time you say okay when do we begin this conversation with God we begin it right now by prayer yes God bless you it's not to, you know, just keep coming if you are just now deciding this is it I'm going forward I'm going to just continue to talk to the ladies that are down here in the front because um, they've been waiting a while. We're ready to start praying. Okay, well, we'll just maybe wait a little longer. Um, but God wants you to know how much He loves you. And He knows each and every one of you. He knows everything you've been through. He knows exactly where you are, exactly what burdens you're carrying, what troubles you come with, what, what your past is. He knows everything. And what's so great about it is that He's going to give you a whole new start, a brand new beginning, a fresh start. No one else can give you that, but God can. He can make you fresh and new. You may have done things or said things or been places or 
or had horrible things happen to you or, or done terrible things yourself, but it's as if you never did, as if you never did. He says that he that is in Christ is an altogether new creation, new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away and all things become new. And we're gonna begin right now with this conversation, just asking God. So would you just bow your heads and maybe you've never prayed, maybe you've prayed before, but I want you to know that pray this prayer after me and mean it from your heart and he will answer you. God, I thank you that you are calling me and I pray that you would receive me as your daughter that you would forgive me of all the things I've ever done. I ask you to come into my life, that I would know you as my God and my Savior and my friend. Forgive me for the things that I've done wrong and help me to follow after you. I give you all of myself, every part of me. I belong to you. Help me in this new life. I would live it to your praise and your glory. Thank you for this fresh start. Thank you for a new beginning. Thank you that I am your child. And I ask this because of my Savior, Jesus, who died for me. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. 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 Welcome to the family of God. Welcome.